Next on Broadway Profiles, David Allen Greer is here to talk about his Tony nomination and his upcoming new Netflix show with Jamie Foxx. Plus, Hip Hop Hooray! It's Freestyle Love Supreme. We're checking out the Hulu documentary. Plus, we've got an exclusive performance from the improv group. And music star Josh Groban is here to talk about his new album, Harmony. I'm Tamsin Fidel. This is Broadway Profiles, presented by Broadway.com. Welcome everyone, I'm Tamsin Fidel. Well, it is the strangest of all award seasons and we're right in the middle of it. Now one year since Broadway shut down due to COVID. Tony Awards voting is finally underway. One of the most nominated shows from the past Broadway season is a soldier's play with seven nods. And among those nominees is one of our favorites, David Allen Greer. He's up for Best Featured Actor. This is his fourth Tony nom. I had a chance to talk to David Allen Greer about his nomination and a new show he's got coming to Netflix. Dad, stop embarrassing me. Congratulations on the uh, the nomination for uh, Soldier's Play. Thank you. I say hesitantly because woo, these Tonys may not be till 2023. I was thrilled. We were all like, oh my God, you know, the, the cast was uh, texting each other. I, I get just great uh, joy, you know, in telling people I'm on Broadway. When I'm on Broadway, David Allen Greer and I love going to Bar Centrale. For those who don't know, that's the hidden bar on Broadway. I talked to Jerry O'Connell, it was a while back, when I interviewed him, and he said, you the two, you would go to um, Bar Centrale all, all the time after performances. How nice it would be to have those. You know, and plus, and since that time, you know, Joe Allen just passed away. I know, I know, I'm so sad. I remember when I came to New York in 1981, um, I was on Broadway, my first job. So I was shown around, you know, and I remember they could make home, you know, Martin Sharma and his guys, they go, this is Joe Allen's. This yeah. is where all the actors eat. And we went in there, I used to go in there almost every day. And then Orso next door, and of course, um, Bar Centrale above, which was the coolest. I hope those things survive. I mean, I, hope, I don't know what's going to happen. I miss it, you know, for, I've been hunkering down doing really well. And for the first time the other day, I just missed going to a movie, mm -hmm. go out for drinks afterwards, talk about the movie and thinking about my favorite restaurants. And I don't know, I don't know when it's coming back, but I do miss it. I hope we can just talk about this, like remember when, I know we will be. Have you been working at all through this? <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, I did a series, which was, it was in town. So that wasn't, I was not trying to travel. Right. And COVID restrictions were good. So, but it still was kind of touch and go. Does that dad stop embarrassing me? Yeah, with Jamie. It's just been awesome, you know, reconnecting. What was it like working with Jamie again now after all this time? You know, it, really, it was like being back together with an old teammate or band member and uh, just feeding off each other. And it's been the easiest. I do want to ask you about uh, ABC launching um, the uh, primetime news magazine, Soul of a Nation. I was looking at the list uh, of people that are involved in it. And um, I mean, look, ABC said it outright, oh, like this is this is what we need to be talking about. But also there's been such a need um, of, 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 of this type of programming. Why hasn't it been done before? A lot has come about in the last two years. Sure. For a long time, I felt uh, I didn't have a right to speak on race and politics because I wasn't an expert. And I, the older I've gotten is uh, I've just kind of owned my experience and just spoken from what I know, not more than what I think or right. hope and all that kind of stuff. So I'm really uh, happy to speak on and about race and politics in our culture. The Tony's not the only award show at the top of our minds. In fact, the Grammys are this weekend. So here's a look at the nominees for Best Musical Theater Album. Amelie, the original London cast recording. American Utopia, Jagged Little Pill, Little Shop of Horrors, the new off-Broadway cast album. 
soft power, and the Prince of Egypt. Broadway.com correspondent Charlie Cooper spoke with Broadway composer and lyricist Stephen Schwartz about his nomination for the Prince of Egypt. Thanks, Tamsin. Stephen Schwartz is no stranger to accolades. He's nominated for a Grammy Award for the Prince of Egypt cast recording. I spoke to the legendary music maker about his amazing career and staying creative. What quarantine been like for you? Let's kick it off with with that, especially after the um, Prince of Egypt opened in London earlier this year, but then of course had to pause. Yeah, I mean, the whole year has been so strange. I mean, obviously it's been strange for everybody, but you know, just from my perspective, we had just opened Prince of Egypt in London and everything was going well. And, you know, we ran a couple of weeks and then suddenly, boom, you know, had to pause with everybody else. We were very lucky. It was very serendipitous that we happened to be able to do the cast album, you know, Prince of Egypt um, before the show opened, which one doesn't normally do. But then very fortuitously, we, you know, we were able to have the cast album. So of course your career has spanned, what, over four decades, you've written so many hits and won such a plethora of awards, um, including of course four Grammys and now most recently you have a Grammy nomination for the Prince of Egypt. What does that mean to you and does it feel different um, each time you're nominated? Like, is, does the experience feel different for you? Well, sure. I mean, you know, because each project is different and one puts so much of oneself into it. Uh, we, you know, we were particularly happy, obviously, about the Grammy na- nomination for the Prince of Egypt album because the show isn't there, because it's unusual for uh, a London cast a- album um, to get that kind of recognition. Um, you know, so that was very gratifying. I'm, I'm happy for the recognition. Of course, The Prince of Egypt was DreamWorks' first animated film. What was right. it like to have that privilege of writing the songs for this particular feature? And then more than 20 years later, seeing it come to life on stage, like that's nuts. Did you ever even imagine that that would come out of that? Not at all, no. <laughs> but then to have all these years later, um, the, the stage version happen and find that there are so many fans of the movie around the world who were excited about the stage version, Uh, Obviously, that felt great. As the composer, what's that feel like to kind of hear your music come alive with a cast, an orchestra, an ensemble, um, compared to what it sounds like in the film? Well, it was very exciting for the the stage uh, version because we simply couldn't replicate the size of the orchestra that one uses in a film. You know, 90-piece orchestra, you can't do that on stage. And so the question was, well, what are we going to do instead that doesn't just sound like a pale imitation? I asked uh, or August Eriksson um, to orchestrate because he's so good at um, ethnic instruments and doing the kind of research to really um, set a, a score in a in a place and time. And he found all these really cool instruments to write for and orchestrate for. And once I knew a bit about them. You know, I wrote some of the score for those instruments. So it was really fun. Well, it's now been one year since the Broadway shot down, and there haven't been a lot of bright spots since. But it's definitely been great seeing more and more stage performances brought to the small screen. It's a group of friends saying, I can't wait to hear what you're going to say next. We had no idea what we were getting into. Before COVID, Freestyle Love Supreme was just about the most fun you could have at the theater. It's a hilarious infusion of hip hop, improv, and comedy, and now streaming on Hulu. It's an amazing documentary, a 15 year retrospective of the group's beginnings and its journey to Broadway. I had the chance to talk to four members of the group about the documentary, the Freestyle Love Supreme Improv Academy, and why their work matters now as much as ever. Let's get started by talking about uh, just where this all with all began. I, I would like to say, well, I'll wait for the documentary uh, <laughs> as, as a teaser because it gives you a little bit of that idea. But Anthony, Tommy, Lynn, 
Phil all went to Wesleyan University and so did Andrew, um, but all at different kind of times and some of them knew each other, some of them didn't. They came together after college uh, doing workshops in the basement of the drama bookshop. Through that, the love of improv and the love of freestyle rap, it started to gain a little bit more momentum. That's right around the time when I joined. Uh, and Tommy Kale really helped put a structure to it. And we've been doing the same type of structure ever since the beginning, in a way, um, from the basement to the Broadway. But then even prior to Broadway, we decided that we need to help share more of this love with the rest of the world. And so um, some of us came together and, and formed the Academy to be able to give more formal lessons and to help bring more of the, the love to other people. Let's talk about the Academy and um, what what you all have gotten from the Academy. Uh, every, everybody, everyone's gotten something different, I would assume, from it. Yeah, I mean, so I was a student in the Academy and Chris Shockwave was my teacher. And so it was just this thing that used all of these talents that I wasn't using all the time and had never really explored in, in, in that way and it was just a comforting, safe space. Our, our mission is to, is to foster diverse, creative voices. So whether you're a lawyer or a rabbi or a musician or an artist, or you haven't been an artist, you feel for 50 years of your life, we've had people of all ages, all genders, um, all colors of the rainbow come through our, our academy in this short time. So it's not about be becoming the best freestyler, it's about using the tool of freestyle to tell your truth. I think there's also a, you know, a feeling around hip hop that it has to be cool, that you have to be cool. And singing and beatboxing, like you should be good at these things already. Nobody's good at these things already. One of the most important things for us is to build an environment where uh, people feel that they can share their truth and look silly or be vulnerable in doing it and just know that people are going to be listening with, we sometimes say, with open eyes, open ears, and open hearts. There's a lot of fun and failure. That's like, we in the structure of the class is such that like, no one really ever falls. Everyone's there to catch you. Um, but that experience of falling and being like, oh, I didn't, I didn't rhyme with that couplet. Huh. And like, yeah, you didn't. And you go into the next one. And then like that elation, after knowing you didn't rhyme that last one, but you rhymed the next one. Oh, I can do this. Okay, so can I ask you guys a question? Do you think that you could freestyle something for me? Okay, now we about to rhyme, not acapella. Uh, we got a beat that's kind of fly, yes. How like the shockwave decided to screen share for real. Uh, we on Zoom, yo. How do you feel? So, Tamsin, you could free feed me a word. And if I know it, then you can call me a nerd. I will try to work it into a freestyle rhyme. Uh, you can drop it, and now is the time. Laughter. Oh yes, laughter. Seriously, that is the exact thing that we're after. Especially in this new incredible chapter. Laughter is the best medicine, that's why my head is in your face. That's why I'm looking at you weird. Uh, yeah, I hope my, my hit screen history is cleared. Why did I even bring that up? Laughter is something that I have to... Uh, Pastor, my man just below me, at least in my screen sharing. Um, yes, you better be preparing. His name is Carrick and I love him dearly. Uh, let's feed him a word because he's so near to me. Mm, I love you too, Kelly. I'm laughing hard, yo. I'm laughing from belly. Let me get the word. I'm gonna say something absurd. And here we go. I'm like flying like a bird. What you got? Love. Love. Oh, from above. From a sin. What's the next word, Tamsin? Broadway profile. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah, I gotta get the nail file. Make myself look good on this Broadway profile. What's going on? Yeah, I got the Zoom. 
on Phillips in Gallery View. And you know, with my friends and the beat just stopped. What's the hunch? Yeah, we're chilling and we looking like the Brady Bunch. It's one, two, three, four, and five. With Tamsin, yeah, she's the next guy. Maybe she will get on the beat a little bit. Give us some words and maybe she can play a bit. And we got Nelly, yeah, he's making all the waves. So happy to be here with all my friends today. <laughs> Okay, so we still have a lot more to talk about on this edition of Broadway Profiles. The Broadway stage, a Spike Lee joint. You'll hear from some of the stars of the new HBO film, American Utopia. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles. David Byrne's American Utopia is currently streaming on HBO Max. When American Utopia opened on Broadway, we spoke to the former Talking Heads frontman. Luckily, I have a pretty nice catalog of songs, so I can kind of cherry pick songs that help kind of create a narrative arc and kind of connect the dots, as it were, for what we're doing. There's other certain songs that I've done that may be really popular where I can go, okay, that one does not fit this particular show, but this one does. And there's plenty of popular ones in, that, we, that we're doing, and then there's some that are not so well known, but my experience has been that because the staging is, there's always something going on, uh, people get excited about the popular ones, but they, they don't lose, their attention doesn't waver when it's something new that they're getting. And now we're hearing from some of the performers in the film. Broadway.com correspondent Charlie Cooper with the story. Oftentimes when things are taken from the stage to film, the concern might be, is this gonna translate? Is it is the message still gonna feel the same? Is the you know the energy still gonna feel the same? Um, I know that you guys were in the Hudson Theater performing this, and I know it's an intimate space. Now you're bringing it into someone's most intimate space, their homes. So can you kind of speak on how performing at the Hudson maybe will help this translate a lot better? It's interesting because on the road we did uh, I think 240 something shows and every space was different. Uh, yeah. And so we were really used to kind of just going with the flow and figuring out, adapting to whatever space we're in. Uh, and I, I think, you know, when we got to the Hudson, it was this extreme weird kind of comfort that we weren't used to, to be in the mm -hmm. same place over and over again, literally not a different theater every, every day, which is what we did on the road. And so I think it was like this perfect timing of like Spike coming in when we were in this like really deep stride of the show of having created this energy on the road and then coming into this space and really honing it. You know, with Spike filming, we had to become acclimated and being able to play on the same stage for 16 plus weeks, uh, it became more comfortable for us and so Spike had points where he would film on stage while we were performing. So because we had, you know, we were really comfortable with the spacings, um, that's kind of what brings it, you know, the audience on stage with us, because you're seeing it from different perspectives that you won't, you wouldn't see when you're sitting in the audience. So you're gonna see like from above head or you'll see how our feet move. You know, you're just really immersed in it. And I think that's what Spike did that made it really amazing and kind of bring it to life for everybody. And you guys have a particularly hard job because you're singing, you're dancing, you're playing instruments. Like, how is your brain even like, functioning? Playing a, a, an instrument with your hands that's also moving with you and you're doing the choreography and you're singing. It's definitely like a, you know, one of these type of things where you're just like, yeah. can I do this? <laughs> Still ahead, music star Josh Groban is here to talk about his new album, Harmony. I'm Tamsin Fidel. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Broadway Profiles. I'm Broadway.com Editor-in-Chief Paul Wontore. Multi-platinum music superstar Josh Groban is on tour virtually. He's holding a series of virtual concerts in support of his new album, Harmony. We had a chance to chat. How, how does music help you get through these times? Is it an escape for you? And digging into projects like this, is this really sort of what you need to, to oh, keep yourself going in a healthy way? I, I, I need it. It's my lifeblood right now. I think for so many people, both listeners and creators, it's uh, it's one of the it's one of the things that we can still 
enjoy to the fullest. On the one hand, there's a community of togetherness that the grading curve is that we are all in this together. But we, of course, we know that there are different levels of that and privileges in that and, and different ways that people are coping and different, different, um, you know, different ways that people are trying to get through this. But one thing that is, I think, universal for all of those ways is music and is art. So I thought, you know, this album, I'm just going to pick songs that I've wanted to sing forever and fan requests and great arrangements and just sing my face off. Um, and of course, like songs just came about. So this is going to be, a, you know, an, an album of, of, of covers with a couple of new original songs that are, are two of the most poignant that I've ever written. I'm Tamsin Fidel. This is Broadway Profiles, and we'll be right back. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the other ways that Broadway artists have been getting creative during this shutdown. Because right now, Michael Urie, Anne Harada, and Colby Lewis are starring in the virtual production of the new play Smithtown. It's about four residents of a Midwest town who fall victim to technology gone awry. Shining a light on something that is extremely disturbing, um, this sort of idea of social media, uh, revenge porn, um, the way that, that like someone can be um, harassed or assaulted uh, this, in this way um, through their through their phone. You know, I mean, my whole my whole piece is about how this is a weapon, and it is such a weapon. I mean, we want to protect everybody. Wants to protect the people that you love, and this sort of social media. It makes it impossible. I was very disturbed by the play when I first read it. I thought it was going to be um, painful to do, exciting to do, but painful. Um, and it, it certainly was, and watching it was painful. But I think I think the conversations that the play can lead to and the, um, the sort of uh, uh, warnings that it, it, it puts into the air are important. I found that being in my home, in my own kitchen, um, bringing this woman to life made it so much more personal and um, as opposed to being you know in some rehearsal space or I, it, it, it's such a personal piece. The thing about theater you know this is why I miss the theater so much is that it really it really does make you look inward and 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 a, a good play should make you think about yourself and the whole world and and you should walk away talking about that and how, how the play speaks to you. And, and that's gonna do it for us. Until next week, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles, presented by Broadway.com.